Hey, what's going on? It is Greg O'Gallagher here with you today on the Road Trip Podcast. And I have John Goodman on the call. Um, he's actually the founder of the Personal Training Development Center. He's worked with you know tons of individuals to help them kind of build a, a great personal training business. And I know a lot of people on the call have been asking um, that have been interested in, in personal training. Um, moreover, even people that are not in, interested in personal training will be talking about some really cool stuff um, as well, you know, how... Uh, how in the process of, of building a big biz, business, um, there was a pretty big turn to the dark side. Um, and we'll be kind of, and John will be sharing that story with us today, which, is, which I'm quite excited for. Uh, John, anyways, I won't talk any longer. How are you today? <laughs> I'm doing awesome. I, I, like the, uh, I like the scare tactic. I'm going to tell you about turning to the dark side. Dark side, yes. How to avoid the dark side. Uh, yeah, I did it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm doing awesome, man. Let's All right. This. Cool, cool. Yeah, so um, let's kind of just give the listeners a little bit more about your background. How did you get started in the fitness industry, and when did you decide to help teach personal trainers um, how to, you know, market themselves and, and, you know, build their brand and build their business? Yeah, absolutely. So I was a, at 18 years old, I actually started personal training training at the university gym where I went to school and I was studying kinesiology there. So by 23, I had quite a bit of experience for personal trainers. And at that point, I kind of reached what many would assume or consider to be, you know, the top level of, of earning potential for conventional personal training. I was charging somewhere around $100 now. I think it was 97 um, I was making some money for referring my overflow of clients to other trainers. And I was the senior trainer at my club, so I was making a bit of a salary for, um, for training other trainers and helping with the hiring process as well. So that kind of scared me because at 23 years old, I didn't really know where to turn. Um, and I, it also wasn't the quality of life that I knew that I wanted to have. I always said that by the time I was 35, my goal was to spend every waking minute with my, you know, hopefully kids at that point. And, uh, and I knew that that wasn't going to be possible with the way that my career was. I think it's possible with personal training, but the way that I kind of organized my schedule wasn't possible to do that. Mm -hmm. So I started looking at ways to make alternate streams of income, and long story short, I decided to write a book for personal trainers. And um, and a few years later, I mean, three years later, that book has now been is now being used in colleges, mentorships around the world to train trainers. Um, it's coming out in a revised, updated, and expanded version pretty soon. Like it's it's just completely, I guess, changed my life and put me down a different path, which led me to develop the Personal Trainer Development Center, as you said. Um, which, I mean, in 2014, reached 2.5 or 5 million trainers around the world, which is just mind-boggling. Wow. And and, uh, and since then, I've just kind of, you know, gone through various stages where I've dove deep into various different aspects of internet marketing, some some in the dark side, as you alluded to, which we could talk about. And my mission now is in taking what I know about really content marketing and, and developing high quality content and getting it to spread purposefully and using those skills to um, kind of clone my site for as many preventative healthcare industries as possible. Because I look at the rising trends in obesity and, and healthcare costs that are going to cripple society in the next five, ten years. And to me, the only solution is preventative medicine, preventative care. But for a whole host of reasons, preventative care practitioners aren't as successful. It's not they're not as viable careers as reactive care practitioners. And um and the only way to make that happen is really to teach them how to market themselves better, how to how to do better um in the aspects of their job away from actually treating patients, clients, whatever you want to call them. So that's my mission now. Okay, cool. It's actually funny that you bring up preventative care because um, yeah, that's how like the Western uh, medical industry works. Is people just want to have that quick, quick kind of solution, that you know, that quick pill to handle their symptoms or whatever it is. Um, and you know, usually people just let themselves get. Well, yeah, uh, I mean, it's it, yeah. it's it's medicine for sure, but it's it's a societal thing, right? Um, Nassim Taleb tells gives a thought experiment actually in one of his books, you know, author of Black Swan and and a number of others. Uh, and the thought of somebody on September 10th, 2002, who went to the airline commission and said, there's going to be a tragedy tomorrow. We need to put in bulletproof doors. We need to put in security measures. He would have been laughed at and ridiculed. If that same person would have really pushed the, the issue, he probably would have been fired and never thought of. But the, the fact of the matter is he would have prevented 
you know, this huge tragedy from happening, whereas all of the reactive people, the firemen, you know, justifiably received all of the accolades for helping people in the aftermath. And that's just a good parallel for how doctors work, how personal trainers work, how physiotherapists work, how naturopathic doctors work. And the difference, I mean, in providing something that is potentially going to help people at some point in the future versus I have a problem, fix it now. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's, yeah, I mean, we, that's, it's, that's, I like how you brought that up, the whole idea of, you know, being able to uh, help, you know, preventative healthcare providers um, with their businesses because we have this huge health crisis on the hands. It's only going to get worse. Right, and I think that that's truly, I mean, the only solution. I, I, I really, really do. And the fact is, I mean, naturopathic doctors, for example, naturopathic doctors that are, are board certified um, in North America, in a lot of places, naturopathic naturopathy is like a one-year course, but in North American naturopathic doctors is, the training is actually very similar to that of a medical doctor. Um, mm -hmm. And, I mean, they're very much empirical and research-based and, and all, you know, like any profession, there's, there's people who are not so good, but um, there's a lot of misconceptions about what they do. Um, but when you look at the stats, it's actually pretty scary. The average salary, zero to four years out, is $34,000 for a naturopathic doctor in North America. And these are people who exit school usually at 29, 30 years old, over $100,000 in debt. Wow. The result is within the first few years, the dropout rate of the profession is huge because, you know, people go back and become nurses. People, I mean, naturopathic doctors personal train on the side because they can't make ends meet. Like, it's, it's a pretty freaking scary thing when you think about it. Wow. That there's these people who have the potential to be good, but just because of the nature of what they do in giving it the tools to actually heal itself versus, versus somebody coming in and saying, you know, I have this, can you fix it? I think that there's a place for both, but the reality of it is the people, as with workouts, right, the people who say, I'm going to help you kind of fix this thing, um, or I'm going to help prepare you so this thing never happens. <laughs> just it, 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 it's comparing apples and oranges. Like it's just not the same thing. People aren't willing to pay for it. Yeah, I know. I think people have a lot of uh, struggle to have that motivation to like to prevent something. It's hard. I mean, I think it's easy for people to be motivated to like you know have a six pack, look good naked and stuff. But then when it's like, oh, I want to prevent like disease, it's hard to use that as a motivator to like you know as as, as crazy as it seems. That's actually a hard a harder like sell harder. A motivator than you know looking good. Yeah, I mean having a six pack is very emotional, right? Um, but at the same time, there's a lot of people who really want to have a six pack. How many people actually do? And it's the same discussion. I mean, having a six pack is a goal that a lot of people have. Well, it's really fucking hard to get a six pack. Mm -hmm. And so, and what happens? I mean, you get into this concept of procrastination, and procrastinators are addicted to immediacy. I mean, human beings are addicted to immediacy. Everything that we do, we need some, some immediate gratification from it, and social media has only made that worse. And what this immediate gratification does is give us a dopaminergic response. It's give us a bit of a hit of dopamine, this feel-good hormone, whereby, you know, if you put a like out on Facebook or you put a status out on Facebook and somebody likes it, you get a bit of a hit of feel-good. Hmm. Well, what does that do? It's like any other addiction. The minute you get that immediate gratification, you crave more and you crave more and you crave more and you crave more. And... You crave more. and the, the reason why a lot of people don't necessarily achieve their fitness goals, a lot of it is because you have this goal in the future and there's a lot of like smoke and mirrors about it where people, you know, Photoshop crap and stuff like that where people say it's a lot easier than it is. And people don't understand the steps to get there and people don't have the proper systems built into the steps to get there that give them that gratification at every step to push them along the way. And, I mean, I think a great fitness professional builds that into their programs. I've looked at some of yours without you probably knowing that I've looked into them. Mm -hmm. um, and they have that built in and they're, they're, they work and you're where you are because you do that with your programs. Um, and that's why your, your clients and people who, you know, invest in your programs have success. Well, yeah. I'm th thank you. I'm flattered. I, I didn't know. Um, and, you know, let's give some like this is a really important topic is 
um, how to build in, um, you know, uh, gratification along the way. So it's literally, it's not like right. it takes six months to finally feel like you've accomplished something, where each and every step of the way is um, is kind of fulfilling and gratifying, and mm -hmm. you have the motivation to stick to it. So I mean, uh, what are your favorite ways to kind of embed, you know, a little bit of you know gratification along the way? Maybe it's not instant gratification like eating, you know, a cream-filled donut, but you know, it it fulfills huh. with you know that. Uh, that belief in yourself and that, those positive emotions? Well, there's a lot of fun ways to do it. I'm, I'm happy to tell you some of mine, and then, um, I mean, I guess we're not speaking specifically necessarily to personal trainers, but, but I'm happy to tell you some of mine for getting big projects done because it's the same kind of idea, and I think anybody listening to this, my hope is that what they'll get out of it is figure out how to kind of build those systems into their own lives, whatever it is. And there's a lot of people have this dream project or a dream physique. Right? It could be to get a six-pack, it could be to write a book, it could be to develop a business idea on the side. When the reality of it is there's this thing in the future that you really want to get to, but to get there is really, really painful. Mm -hmm. right? and, and so there's a lot of places where you can fall off in order to get there, um, especially in the initial phases. And so a couple of things that I do, for example, to write my books, what I do is I actually break it down into the smallest chunks possible. And so um, I wrote a book, to give you an example, where the entire book was 82 cue codes. And, and my opinion when writing books is, is as short as possible, as long as necessary. So I pretty much wrote out and did all my research and figured out how long I wanted, or what I wanted to cover in this book to make my point. And then I broke it down into subjects, and, and it ended up being 82 subjects, just randomly. And then I put those 82 subjects on cue codes, and I wrote down all my notes on those 82 subjects. And I did this three or four times to make sure I had more or less what I wanted on each one. And then I went back and revisited those cue codes three times and organized them. And like my table was pretty funny because I had this big glass table. And you see 82 cue codes like lie, laid out and I ate on the couch for the, those couple days. And then um, what I have is now 82 cue codes on the right side of my computer. Each cue code is one section of the book. Each section of the book is three to 600 words, right? A really manageable chunk. It's really difficult to sit down and say, okay, I'm going to write a 3,000 word chapter today. You know, Hemingway was famous because he would always say he would never end a chapter at the end of a writing bout. What he would do is he, he would always end mid-thought. So the next time he went to write, he could start right back up because it was so, it's so painful to start at the beginning. And so I had 82 cue codes on the right side of my computer. And I'd pick one up, and I'd write out that section, however long I took, and then I'd take that cue code, and I'd flip it face down on the left side of my computer. Like, like that simple. So in facing that cue code left on, down on my computer, I got, right, I got that little reward. I could see that pile building. You know, you talk about, I see that pile filling on my left, and, and it's small, manageable chunks. At any point in time, I could go to take a piss, and I'm back there, and I'm, I'm you know, have something manageable. I don't need to sit back down and refocus myself. Uh, that's one way that I do it, for sure. And, and, I mean, pretty much all of my writing is done with some sort of a method like that um, that I find really helps. The other way, um, not so much immediate gratification, but get myself into the mindset of doing something is I actually have songs, I use music, I know other people that use clothing or watches or stuff like that, but I use music to prime myself into, into doing something. So I have specific songs that I only listen to when I'm starting certain things. I have a song that I listen to at the beginning of every workout. I have a song that I listen to when I was squatting heavy before every set of it on. I have a song that I listen to before I start a writing session, and it's always the same one. And the idea behind that is... There. Anchoring. 100%, right? It's, it's very much priming. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, it's watch a basketball player take the free throw. I mean, pretty much the only movement in sports that's consistently the exact same. Mm -hmm. And what do basketball players do? They have this thing that they go through. Everybody's a little bit different, but they flip the ball up and down. They spin it. They bounce it twice. They, they put the cross on... on their two shoulders and forehead, and then they shoot the ball. It's it's the exact same idea. You know, they only wear watch when they're looking, for example. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so so I guess those two things 
um, really helped me separate, especially working from home and, and I travel and work quite a bit, so getting myself into habits and new really helps me separate like work time from fun time, from gratitude time, all that, all that fun stuff. Yeah, I mean, you pretty much brought up two really solid points that anyone can apply to any goals they have, whether it's fitness, building a business, studying, I mean, a anything. It's like having that ability to track progress along each and every step of the way. So instead of seeing how mm -hmm. far you have, how, how like how how long you have to go, you can see the pro you can see how far you've come. Because um, I mean, it's very intimidating. It's like right. I think people want, yeah, people make the mistake of. Maybe they want to have a six a six pack app, so they want to have a multi million dollar business, and they're just looking at that top step. It's like you know you're at the bottom of a pyramid, and literally you have to, all you're thinking about is that top step and how long it's going to take to get there, instead of focusing on that that one step <laughs> you can take right now, or you know the ten other steps you already walked up. It's like you know you're getting as long as you're getting closer, you should be so motivated. Um, and yeah, put, putting out cue cards and like flipping them over as you get further and further done. It's like that feeling of accomplishment. I mean, that's why people love video games, is because they don't like it, they're just all about leveling up their character, getting new, unlocking new skill quests. Um, yeah, it's almost addictive. And if you can like take that that concept and apply it to your goals, it makes the journey um, fun. It makes it you know almost in a certain way addictive. I mean, if you're building like a, a website and, and yeah. at first you have you know ten visits a day and then you're up to fifty, I mean that's really freaking cool. Like you're pumped about that. Um, but yeah, that's fifty people who care what you do, which is, I mean, and it, it, like it, it's funny because we're in this like vanity metric, inflated internet economy world where like a thousand fans on a Facebook page isn't considered a lot. A thousand people is a ton of, of people that care about you. Like if you would ask me five years ago and said, "Hey, there's going to be a thousand people who care enough to listen about you spout off whatever's going on in the top of your head every single day, multiple times a day." I'd be like, hell yeah, <laughs> right? But now it, it doesn't seem like a lot. Like that, I think that's such an important point to like not be glossed over that you just made. I, I mean, it's, it's a huge amount of people. Like it's such a special thing to be able to do that. Right. I mean, I mean actually, Chris and I, we did a podcast um, about the difference between winners and losers. And like I think one massive difference is, you know, winners focus on the positive. They, they see the good. So they don't see how much left they have to do. They don't see, you know, how someone else is, is, is like, has 10,000, only have 1,000, they don't get discouraged. They're like, look at this progress. Mm -hmm. I'm growing. I'm getting closer to my goal. They kind of focus on the positive and they are able to kind of instill, you know, more motivation and encouragement in themselves as opposed to, like, get discouraged. So that's, like, a, a very important point. Focus on the progress you're making. Don't focus on how far you still have to go. Right, it, and it's so fascinating. I mean, all of the uh, I, I love reading a lot of philosophy and, and psychology, and I one of the overwhelming themes in developing positive mindsets and and productivity and strategy and stuff like that, not so much strategy, sort of productivity and mindset, is is exactly what you just said. Is is very much seeing the positive and understanding. You know, from every man, I can learn something. Mm -hmm. I mean, a cool. Uh, but you. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Go for it. Oh, I was, just gonna, I, I was gonna kind of hope on the point that everything that you know is you only understand it or you only make sense of it in relation to something that you've already exist that that you've already experienced, mm -hmm. right? Everything, every emotion that you feel is a reference is in reference to an experience that you've already had, and so when we understand that, it it it's pretty fascinating because then you can look at really negative experiences. You can look at lost while traveling. You can look at like going to, I mean, I, I tell a story, like I go to a coffee shop. I'm in Uruguay right now. Nobody speaks a word of English. I go to a coffee shop and I know that three things are going to happen. I know that I'm going to feel like a complete idiot. <laughs> I know that I'm probably not going to get what I want. And I also know that I'm probably going to be rude because I don't understand the customs of where I am well enough. And what does that make me do? Well, that experience sure is negative, but that makes me appreciate such a simple experience as going to a coffee shop back at home in Toronto and ordering a cup and knowing what I get and getting a smile from the barista. And so then you can take a look at any negative experience that you have and say, well, the worst this experience is, 
the better reference point it's going to become for me when I have a positive experience. Right. Very cool. I like that. Um, well, here let's let's we've kind of you know fleshed out two, uh, well two of your really cool topics. Um, I guess the, the other one you're talking about was you know using uh, music to kind of bring you into that state. Whereas if you're always listening to a specific song at the beginning of your workout, well even if you don't feel like going to the gym, if you if you feel lazy, once that song plays, then your brain's gonna be like, oh, it's time to work out, which is quite mm -hmm. cool. That's like that's actually. Uh, a pretty cool trick. I mean, it, it, it don't, the only way for it to work is if you literally only listen to that song at that, that scheduled time or when you're about to study. Um, that's like, you know, for me, it's like usually when I get up and I have a couple cups of coffee, that's when I'll like just pour into going into work. So if like I drink coffee, I feel like doing work, funny enough. Mm -hmm. um, right. So, I mean, yeah, those are some, some two, two really cool points. Um, I want to let, let's shift gears and let's talk a bit about the dark side because I know that um, when you were, you were telling me when you were building your business, um, there was almost a dark side to it where all of a sudden it started to be at the expense of um, your enjoyment of relationships with your close friends, family, loved ones. So how did that happen? And, and how, how would you kind of avoid that? What lessons do you have um, for people listening? Yeah, it's... I'll cover the first, or the, your second question first. I mean, how would you avoid that? I, I don't know if I would, in retrospect, I mean, it was a painful experience to go through, but it also taught me so much that I don't know if I would mm -hmm. avoid that, you know, if I could go back and change things. I think it's important for people to go through, you know, pain and hurt to really understand what's special for them. Again, this reference point. Um, I absolutely lost friends, but you know what? I kept the really close ones to me. And separating myself, as, as I'll talk about in a minute, separating myself from the world. I mean, I really isolated myself from everybody for uh, six months. Wow. And, and I'll tell you that separating myself for six months really, really forced me to, to figure out who was special to me and what was special to me and what was important to me and what wasn't. And there's no way that I would have done that if I hadn't gone through, I guess, that painful period. And when I got home, I mean, I recognized, for example, just people who were friends of convenience and people who were really special friends of mine. And, and it actually surprised me quite a bit. There were people who I hung out with every single day that, I mean, I hardly spoke to when I got back just because I recognized that, sure, they were a buddy to, to whatever, go for a workout with or, or something, but they weren't a really close friend. And, mm -hmm. and we had kind of grown apart from each other in a lot of ways. So I don't know if I would change things. I think I, I think it's just important that when somebody, if, if I'm in the position to give unsolicited advice, which I guess I kind of am, if somebody does go through an experience like it's kind of painful, to actually take the time to really think about what they've been through and think about the importance of it and think about the lessons that they gained from it. I, I truly don't believe that we spend enough time thinking about thinking. And and I think that, you know, there's too much effort being put on reading books and less time, less effort put on thinking about the stuff that we read in those books and how they apply to our lives. But going back to, I guess, the story and to put this into a bit of perspective, so I really had no idea I was going to develop like an online business. I mean, I it was never some master master plan. I knew that I liked to travel. I always figured that there was probably something else to it in this world than working sort of a, a nine to five or in a trainer's world a six a.m. to ten thirty p.m. job. But I didn't really know what it was, and I didn't even know that like internet marketing or anything existed. I mean, I had never read any blogs about it. I'd never bought any programs about it, and never got a coach. Nothing like that. I just I just built a website and kind of did what I thought somebody should do, which is just reach out to people doing cool stuff, try to get them involved in your whatever you're doing, understand that there's no competition, live by the theory of abundance, and um, just put out good stuff day in and day out and provide as much value as possible. And then when I decide to sell something, make sure that it's of the utmost quality. And what happened was. I guess the site started to grow pretty quickly and I started to get pretty good at this internet marketing thing and also in search engine optimization and, and email marketing and automation and segmentation stuff. And I figured out that there were just a number of ways to make money that weren't being tapped and like pretty easy ways. 
And so I started to just build businesses. <laughs> and it's, it's pretty funny looking back at just how much stuff I had. But I started to just build businesses, and some of them built with more integrity than others, um, some of which people will never know. But, I mean, just to test out theories, to give you an idea, like I would just build Facebook pages of 15,000 people and shut them down just to figure out, like, what to do. Um, because it was so easy to me at the time. Now, Facebook's gotten a little bit harder since then, but it was just so easy. I would just set up pages as review sites. I would rank them better than anybody else who would review affiliate products and supplements and just make money from it. Wow. And um, and I, there are still, I mean, I've shut down most of the stuff because I just don't personally like it. But there's still a couple of the ones that are up there that, you know, I went to go shut one down when I had to pay for the $15 a year hosting and I took a look in the account, and it's like, oh, they sent me $750 last month. <laughs> like, sorry, last year, not last month. Um, so what happened was, I, I, I mean, fitness is relatively easy once you have the marketing tools to make money off of because it's sold for the most part. And, um, and I really hated myself for a lot of the stuff that I was doing. But I found that I was so obsessed with it that I kind of got in this this self-perpetuating spiral downward, this, this kind of rabbit hole. And I couldn't get myself out of it in Toronto. I mean, it was just too busy. There was too much stuff going on. Um, I had created a very reactive business model, which I would never advise. Um, what do you mean by that, reactive and, business model? Um, reactive business model, The I had to work for the business day in and day out. The business wasn't working for me. Oh, okay. Um, okay. There were no active, you know, I, I didn't have enough assets out there. Everything that happened, I kind of needed to build on top of each other. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there were there was some passive stuff, but it all kind of needed to be touched. Mm -hmm. And in order to maintain it, especially with the SEO stuff, it needed, you know, the parent site. It's all about building, like, parent sites and then sites underneath it and having them link back and, because I was doing a lot of fitness writing for large websites and magazines and stuff like that at the time, it was pretty easy to get strategic links back, which pretty much popped me up because of the, the link quality above anybody else who was just putting up review sites and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I ran away, is what it comes down to. And um, I ran away, I, I broke up with my girlfriend who fortunately took me back and she's actually here now and I'm you know crazy in love with but I broke up with her and pretty much cut off all communication with my family my friends I mean I sent my parents an email every two weeks to tell them I was alive hmm. and um, and I ran away to Hawaii for six months to just figure my stuff out um, I spent three months in Oahu in a town called Laie on the North Shore which is actually a Mormon town funny enough and um, and I went to the room in a house on the beach, and I mean, I would go for four or five days without speaking to another human being, which, if you've ever done that, I mean, really not spoken to another human being, it is a scary thing. I mean, you learn things about yourself that I, I don't, <laughs> I think it's important to know, but um, I, I, you know, and I started to get into a bit of a meditation practice, but more than anything else, I started to really get into journaling, and so my only rule was I had to write down every single thing that I thought. And again, if, if anybody out there has ever done that, that is a scary thing to do. Like, you think about a lot of really, really weird, I mean, sexual, angry, uh, illogical thoughts. And what I recognized, there were, there were two things that kind of came out of that. The first is that I recognized that I was being driven by emotion. And... And I, I believe that is to control one's emotions. I mean, in every area of life, not just business, is to control one's emotions and, and not be driven by it. Because the minute that you're having any kind of a disagreement or negotiation or anything like that, uh, I think he who controls his emotions wins. Mm -hmm. um, so that was number one. And number two was I pretty much took a look at everything I had and... I mean, I shut down five businesses when I was in Oahu in three months' time. I just hated the stuff I was doing, and I hated myself for it, and I realized that it was running my life. It wasn't, added to it. it wasn't adding to it. So I figured I'd take as long as I needed to in Oahu to figure that stuff out. It ended up taking about three months, just a little bit more. And then I left Oahu and moved to Maui for three months. 
And so the idea with that was, okay, I'm leaving this part of my life behind, and then Maui was building stuff back up. So Oahu was pretty much, was very much breaking down. Maui was, okay, everything's broken down. I know what I want. I have a better idea of who I am. Now I'm going to take the work to build myself. This is back up. And that's where I really got into reading a lot of philosophy, and that's where I got into um, really, really, really believing in this theory of abundance and this theory that people are just naturally awesome. And there's, there's no other way to say it. Like, people are awesome all around the world. Everybody you meet, almost everybody you meet is really good. If you meet somebody that's going down a bad path or a rough patch, like, they're probably confused. It's not that they're trying not to be good or they're being forced into a position or something. And, um, and so I started to build stuff back up from there. And, and I mean, there was always, I'm just a much, I guess I, I see things in perspective a lot better. Wow. Than I ever did. Yeah, that was a very powerful um, journey. I just want to kind of. So I mean, I guess I just want to add, like, uh, I mean, I, I'm guessing that you know that that you know you being compelled to go on this experience in Hawaii and isolate yourself and see what's really going on is probably because you know you in in Toronto you know you're kind of you're succeeding with your businesses it was, everything was going r right in a lot of ways but at the same time it wasn't working like you weren't happy it was just kind of like it was just you weren't r going on that right path and so then it's interesting as, as though it's like in today's society I mean it's so easy to escape from yourself it's so easy to like to hide from you know what's going on inside you we have t we have so many different forms of escaping you know you can watch TV you can go uh, you know drink you can do anything you want um, mm -hmm. and so having that isolation period where literally it's just you, your thoughts, a notebook. There's no, there's no one else to distract you. There's no distractions. Literally yeah. all, everything inside you that was probably unconscious, that was just being expressed out in different ways, finally comes to the surface. And then it was probably an amazing point of clarity. I can only imagine. It was an amazing point of clarity. I mean, it's scary. It It is really it was scary figuring out what was going on in my mind and how my thoughts were running me and destroying me as opposed to vice versa. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. I think that's such a great point in the, uh, in the availability of methods of escapism. And not only that, a lot of the methods, the purveyors of these methods of escapism, <laughs> to give a very conspirational view of, of the world, a lot of these um, purveyors of, of these methods of, of escapism understand just how powerful what they do is and understand how to use those things to get you hooked into them. Mm. I mean, there's a lot of these things that really kind of get you stuck. I mean, Facebook is a perfect example. It gets you stuck into it. I mean, why do you think people post selfies and duck lips? Is because they crave the perceived social support. I mean, our self-worth is dependent on what we think others think of us. Right. So whether, whether you think that I'm attractive or funny is completely irrelevant to my self-worth. What matters to me is whether I think that you think that I'm attractive or funny. <laughs> and in understanding that, look at look at Facebook, right? You pretty much put your highlight reel out on Facebook and you get all these people or, or you selectively self-represent in certain ways about things that you want others to know about you and it makes you feel good and then you crave that more and more and more and more and more and you get hooked into this platform. Right. Yeah, no, I mean, that's it. It's a very, very important point and... Uh... Yeah, it's 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 not the real, it's not something that's ever going to bring you happiness. It's only going to cause more stress in your life because you're just gonna you're just gonna want more and more and more. And then when people don't pay attention to you, you're gonna be dependent on that. It's it it leads to very manipulative behavior because you're constantly trying to get people to acknowledge, accept, and like you and validate you. Hundred percent. And I mean that's just one example. And so when running a business or something like that, I mean especially in the fitness and health industries where it's so emotional. Um, I mean, you talk about how you look, and uh, it, it, it's something that you can't hide. 
Um, so it's so emotional, and as a result, it's very easy to engage and profit from manipulative practices. And uh, and I mean that's some of the the troubles. I mean there are ways to of course oppose those. And and like I said, most people really are good. I don't think everybody is really good, but I think most people really are good. Um, but yeah, I mean it it is powerful. It's right. it can be scary stuff when you take a look at it. Right. I mean you know even just looking at your um your journey in Hawaii. I mean I think people listening maybe they don't have to go to Hawaii and isolate themselves for three months, but it is important to every once in a while, maybe every day, every week, stop and just, you know, just look into what's going on in your life. Um, look in, like, are you happy with the way things are going? Why are you doing this? Why are you pursuing this and this and this? Are you happy in your relationship or whatever? And so, like, it, like it's hard to kind of pull back and make sure, like, and just to consciously pull back and see if you're going in the right direction. Um, but it's helpful not to get you know, kind of just sucked into the matrix of everything that's going on, not to get like sucked into like the the Facebook uh, rat race of just getting more and more uh, validation, likes, and stuff like that. Um, and and I mean it, it's it, I think when most people find out what it feels like not to be too dependent on other people's reactions, and like it's actually almost a breath of fresh air. It's relieving in a lot of ways, and I, you know, I'm not saying I'm perfect at all, um, because in a way, all a lot, like all of us, at some point, we're we're, we're kind of get we want that validation, but at a certain point, it becomes too like addictive. Well, hundred percent. I mean, I I crave it too, but I think the difference, and I guess if I were to give, you know, give any kind of advice on this topic, is well, first of all, note that it's incredibly difficult and takes a lot of uh, introspection, but Understand that it's going to happen. I mean, it happens to me. You just mentioned it happens to you. Absolutely. I put up a status update that's personal. Nobody likes it, whatever. I feel like shit about myself. I mean, it, it is what it is, but I think what's most important is, is to be able to actually understand what's going on and think about what's going on there and know what's important. And, and one of the things that I always use to remind myself is okay, well, if somebody is really going out and their validation, you know, their self-worth is dependent on them getting likes and stuff like that and they're posting selfies, don't think ill of them. I mean, those are people who probably need to be helped more than anything else because they're using that to replace something that they may not be getting or they may not be recognizing in other aspects of their life. And so, I mean, if, if when be able to recognize when you or, or I'm able to recognize now when I'm in that state and I'm able to uh, in recognizing it snap out of it mm -hmm. and I think that's the most important thing right yeah I mean this is a this is actually a very important topic I'm glad we kind of landed on it um, when wow, I it's random I mean this wasn't planned it wasn't <laughs> it's very very organic I mean when I th this is something that like when I immerse myself in a lot of Eckhart Tolle becoming present to the moment, that's when I kind of was no longer concerned with getting that positive feedback from other people. Um, mm -hmm. Because ultimately, if you, like, ultimately, well, most humans, we want to be happy, we want to be fulfilled, but we have this grandeur idea of what it means to be successful or happy. We try and, like, look at our entire kind of life, but all there is is the moment that unfolds right here, and, and that's it. We only experience life in this present moment. Um, we don't, we, you know, we never experience the future because when it is the future, it is the now. And so we get too, like in the way we get paralyzed by just constantly looking at our entire life uh, through the lens of our past, the present moment, our future, and that creates our whole, our, the, our whole ego um, identity, our whole self-image that we're obsessed with. Um, but when you kind of, it sounds so simple, but when you, you kind of just focus in on this moment and sure, look to the future and the past for practical purposes, but not to define who you are, then all that need for validation and all that stress of thinking about like, oh my God, I have all this to do, it almost washes away, um, right. which is very powerful. And yeah, like, I mean, even if you get really good at just trying to become present, there's always going to be, be that time like, you know, maybe you're at a club with some, with some friends and you try to do a funny dance move. 
and like no one gives you any positive feedback, like, oh, I can't do this anymore. Um, but then if like everyone's like around you supporting you, you know, you feel better. Um, so I mean, it's hard to fully embrace that. But it, it, it sometimes what is really cool is when you literally get negative feedback. Um, yeah. You get no no reaction, no positive validation or support, um, and you feel that diminishment of your ego, but you allow it to be there. So it, it's kind of it's kind of cool. It's like um, it's just to experience that because sometimes by having that ego break down, you realize like nothing's truly lost, um, which is quite cool. And you realize it's kind of like just a a uh, it's um just an illusion, if you will. Yeah, and that's that's cool that you mentioned that. I mean, you very much brought the conversation kind of full circle to some of the stuff we were talking about earlier about about having this goal, this kind of dream project, whatever it is, be it a six pack, be it a book, in the future, and and understanding that you need to build in tasks to achieve that goal. And in my opinion, I mean, you need to build in tasks, and you need to build out rewards and and some sort of media gratification on the path to get there, but. Regardless, it's this idea of you need to build in something for the now. And whatever it is in the future, I mean, the, one of my favorite short stories is by somebody named Robert Hastings. It's called The Station. And, and I, recommend, I recommend everybody read it. I mean, it'll take you five minutes. But the idea behind it is if you're constantly looking for the station, you're never going to recognize when you get there, and you're never going to be satisfied when you get there. And you're always going to be looking for the next station. And the most important thing is to enjoy the journey and to recognize when the points of the journey are special. Right. And to celebrate those and to appreciate those and to show gratitude for those. Right. Yeah, I mean, beautiful. Like, that's the inherent problem with people tying their self-worth into the future because a lot of times people, uh, maybe they want to build a great body, they want to build a great business, but then they tell themselves, I can only be enough. I can only be uh, complete when I get there. And so mm -hmm. the whole the whole journey to their goal, they they feel like they're not enough. They have like this compulsive need to get there. Uh, and then when they're there, it doesn't last because the their their mind that they they programmed is that I'm looking for happiness in the future. So when they so then when it's the present, like so then when they're there, their mind kicks in like, oh, uh, I want something more. Because um, they're, they're stuck in that, that future mode, projecting something into the future. And so that's why you always hear those stories about some person that set out to like achieve something and then it was never enough and they had to do more and more and more. I mean, just look at Wolf of Wall Street. I mean, the, the, <laughs> he just, right. no amount of money was enough. Like a million bucks a week wasn't enough. He, you know, he had to get, get more and more and it becomes like an, an addiction. Right, and what's happiness, right? Happiness is an emotion that we only feel in reference to not happiness. Right. And so, I, I mean, I think what it comes down to is, is I have no idea what I want, and I'm willing to accept that. I have no idea what I want in the future. I think conventional goal setting is inherently wrong for the most part because I don't think people are skilled enough at setting their own goals. I don't think, I don't think people really understand what they want more enough. They're too influenced by what others say that they think they should want versus you know, what they really desire at any given point. And, I mean, do you really want a six-pack? No, probably not. Get laid. Like, it's, you know, do you want to lose weight? No, you want your in-laws to stop giving or saying Snyder mugs to you when you go for an extra serving of pasta at the dinner table. Like, like it's not, I mean, the end goal is very rarely the goal. It's what It's what people kind of make up to, achieve whatever it is they really want to achieve if they were to take a minute and reflect and be honest with themselves. Right. And so it's it's so important to recognize that like your happiness is in relation to something else. You know, the most famous study is was covered. I don't actually remember where the original study is. Maybe we could put it in the show notes. I can find it and send it to you, but it was In, um, in, I think, Predictably Rational by Ariel. John, are you there? Um, $60,000 a year if your neighbor made 50, or $80,000 a year if your neighbor made 100. And people actually chose $60,000. Wow. Right, yeah, and, and it all comes down to these reference points. I mean, what what's what's attractive? 
the same thing. If you want to make yourself seem attractive, what do you do? You find somebody who looks similar to you but is a little bit more ugly and you go with him to bars. <laughs> That's going to make you more attractive, not just in reference to him, but in reference to the whole room. Mm. Like it's, I, I mean, everything is in relation to each other. Right. So that's if if you get anything from this podcast today, it's to find somebody who's a little bit less good looking than you. <laughs> if if you get if you take away one thing, <laughs> that's that that's funny. Um, <laughs> I, I kind of missed the study a bit because I think uh, I lost the connection. But, but yeah, so I think this, the study was basically oh, two, option, like two options, making $60,000 a year living with a neighbor that, or living beside someone that makes 50 or making 80 but your neighbor makes 100 And people prefer right. to make less as long as it's more than their neighbor. Or yep. that's, that's quite funny. That's the idea. Because, well, and, and the corollary to that, of course, is all of your basic necessities need to be met. Mm -hmm. Right, so as long as you're able to pay your bills, as long as you don't have to worry about money, mm -hmm. which in the United States, I mean, these days in Canada, I think you probably need to make closer to 80 to 100 to reach that point. But when the study was done, it was about 60. Mm -hmm. And so the point was, as long as you're making enough that you know that there's a roof over the head and your family's going to eat, then, and, and there's been other studies that show that the happiest people in America make $80,000 a year and anything more than that leads to a decrease in happiness and because it leads to a dependence on making more money and for satisfaction and all of that kind of stuff. There's a lot of cool stuff like that about why we're never happy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, very cool. Well, here, I guess we can kind of um, wrap up here. You know, we've covered some, some very cool stuff, gone full circle. Uh, there hasn't been a, a, a complete like structure, but it's been actually wildly entertaining. Um, are there any final points you want to finish off here, uh, John? I don't think so, other than to say that I'm really happy that we were able to get into this, um, and I want to thank you for allowing me to discuss this with you and, and for giving your thoughts as well right. on, these, on these issues, because I think that there are issues, and I... I think that there's not enough sort of willingness to speak openly about them. So I thank you for letting me do that, and I thank you for uh, your openness in speaking about them as well. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm really glad, like, the conversations kind of organically turn into this direction. And, and um, you know, we didn't get the chance to talk as much about um, building a personal training business, um, but that's something we could probably explore in a future episode. And so for people <laughs> listening... Yeah, and so for people listening... Um, so you have two print books coming out? I've got two print books coming out. The first one is a revised, updated, and expanded version of my first book called Ignite the Fire, The Secrets to Building a Successful Personal Training Career. If I were to do it again, I would have called it something shorter. <laughs> and that's the book that's being used in colleges, mentorships around the world, it's bought by trainers all over the world. I mean, it's, it's just done um, exceedingly well for me, and, and everybody seems to really love it. This is a very much improved version. It's about 18,000 words longer. Um, based on feedback the last couple of years and tens of thousands. We've cut out sections, we've changed sections, we've added sections. There's a lot more in things like high integrity, lead generation and stuff like that. And, and also maintaining your integrity in the fitness industry, which is I think a very important topic as well. Uh, the other print book is called The Personal Trainer Pocketbook. And what that is, is it's the answers to the 48 most common questions that a trainer would ask throughout the day. So the idea is this is kind of a trainer's personal mentor with them all the time. If they have any question about anything, then they flip open to that page, they get the answer, they know exactly what to do, they close the book and they go on with their day. Very cool. Yeah, so I mean anyone listening that is a personal trainer now that um, thinks that they maybe want to become a personal trainer or is interested in, you know, in that, um, definitely these two resources are so helpful. I mean, uh, John sent them to me, I've gone through them. I'm going to go through them again uh, more thoroughly because um, I've only had a couple days, but, uh, but yeah, it was very cool stuff right on the forefront, um, and it will make such a huge difference if you're a personal trainer or you're going to get into personal training, um, because it's not enough just to be a great personal trainer. I mean, it's about marking yourself, branding yourself, and uh, being able to, A, find, like, you need to generate leads, and you have people that, that know about you, because you can be the best personal trainer in the world, but if no one's heard about you, it's not going to do much good, so. Yeah. So cool. Um, well, anyways, thank you so much for coming on, John. Um, it was been a it's been a blast, 
And to listeners, thank you for listening to the episode. Um, you can you know, find more details in the show notes by going to uh, ketobody.com. Um, anyways, we will talk soon. Bye. Thank you.